scriptures. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 8. And we'll read all the way to verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 8. The Apostle Paul says, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. Verse 10, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without, I like this, without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death, for see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also with eagerness to clear yourselves, that what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did, not, who did the wrong, nor for the souls of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the day of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. I like it. They speak like Cajuns. For whatever boast I made to him about you, I was not put to shame, but just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. And this and his affliction for you is even greater. As he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling, I rejoice because I have perfect confidence in you. And Father, we ask you to bless your word as it goes forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Billy Graham preached a message of repentance better than I could ever preach a message of repentance. He was an evangelist. And of all the people, as most of his messages, in fact, I believe just about every one of his messages, he preached a message of repentance. Out of all the thousands and yea thousands and yea thousands of people that came up that aisle when he gave the invitation, only about 10% genuinely repented of their sin. So I ask myself the question, was it because it just wasn't explained enough? Was it because that the person that who spoke about repentance, maybe he didn't have enough charisma? Or perhaps there was some other element missing from the picture that people who genuinely said they trusted Christ with all their heart are not living according to what the Word of God says. Today I want to be able to present that to you. 
And the title of the message again is Repentance Anyone? Because you see the message of repentance continues to go out across this pulpit, pulpit and across other pulpits throughout the church. And you know what? That's the calling. God says that it's not His will that any should perish, but that all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But I must also remind you of this fact, that without repentance, there can be no salvation. And there can be no salvation without repentance. They go hand in hand. On the National Day of Repentance, Joe Wright is a pastor of Central Christian Church in Wichita, Kansas. And on January 23rd, 1996, he was asked to be the guest chaplain for the Kansas State House in Topeka. He prayed a prayer of repentance that was written by Bob Russell, pastor of Southeastern Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And according to the article in the Kansas Star from January 24, 1996, his prayer stirred controversy. And one member of the legislative body walked out. This was back in 1996. Others criticized the prayer. The controversy didn't end there. Later that year in, Col in the Colorado House, Republican Representative Mark Pascal angered lawmakers by using Joe Wright's prayer as an invocation. Some members there also walked out in protest. Paul Harvey got a hold of the prayer and read it on the program. He got more requests for copies of it than any other thing he had ever done. And here's what he prayed. And I quote, Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek direction and guidance. We know your word says, Woe to those who call evil good, but that's exactly what we have done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and inverted our values. We confess that... We have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word and called it a pluralism. We have worshipped other gods and called it multiculturalism. We have endorsed perversion and called it alternative lifestyle. We have exploited the poor and called it the lottery. We have neglected the needy and called it self-preservation. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We have killed our unborn, let me scratch that word killed out, murdered and still do murder our unborn and call it a choice. We have shot abortionists and called it justifiable. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it political savvy. We have converted our, we have coveted our neighbors, neighbors' possessions and called it ambition. We have polluted the airways with profanity and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts today. Try us and see if there be some wicked way in us. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Guide and bless these men and women who have been sent here by the people of Kansas and who have been ordained by you to govern this great state. Grant them your wisdom to rule and may their decision direct us to the center of your will. Amen. Now I can see where today would probably cause an earthquake to go right between Washington, D.C. But nevertheless, in 1996, it caused quite a stir. And maybe that stirred your heart. I don't know. But as I'm looking at the text today, I see that the Apostle Paul had such a great love for the church. In particular, the, the Corinthians and the neighboring house churches. And yet, 
trying to incorporate the world and the, ch and the church will never work. Trying to associate light with darkness will never work. Trying to sit down and have a dialogue with someone who's totally off the page when it comes to the things of God will never work. What works? Repentance. But let me say this too as well. Repentance is a gift from God. None of us deserve it. None of us can work for it. It doesn't matter who you are, how intelligent you are, how much money you have, unless God gives you his gift of repentance, you will never truly repent of your sins. But the appeal, nevertheless, goes on today. It continues ever since Jesus ascended into heaven. In fact, before his ascension, before his death, the message of repentance resounds throughout history. So you see, it is God's will that you repent. Problem is, problem is, some are not willing to do it. Well, let's go to our text here this morning. Again, the title of the message is repentance anyone? And let me just share this. I don't know who quoted it, but repentance, remember, repentance is always difficult, and the difficulty grows greater with delay. First point this morning is true repentance offers no regret. So if we look at our text here this morning, verses 7 and 8, as I read it to you, 2 Corinthians, let's go back to that text. The Apostle Paul, again, he wanted nothing but the best for this church and its, and its inhabitants and its people, the body of Christ. But one thing they must deal with is sin. And, I was, and as though it's an ugly thing that happens, there are churches today that are filled with people who profess to be a Christian but are infested with people who think they can live their lifestyles freely in sin and habitual sin, and nothing ever is going to get done about it. But here Paul's dealing, willing to deal with it. Not only is he willing to, willing to deal with it, but he's also charging the Corinthians to deal with it. Now, this is actually the third letter, by the way, that Paul wrote. The second letter we can't find. It was written, but it was called a severe letter. And nevertheless, it was to highly charge them with the sin that they were actually introducing into the church and thought nothing of it. And so, more than focusing on the sin, Paul was focused on the holiness of the bride of Christ, and that is the church. Verse 7, he says, And not only by his coming also, talking about Titus, but by the comfort with which he was comforted by you as he told us of your longing, your mourning, and your zeal for me. Remember what they had done. They had turned their back on him. They were listening to some false teachers. They began to falsely accuse him. Now, you know, that's got to hurt. The fact that you people who had loved you, you brought them the gospel, they were coming to Christ, and now they're turning their backs on Paul. And so, you know, I, I couldn't think of anything more grieving than that. But yet at the same time, he didn't give up. He wanted them to understand who their Savior was and to come back to the cross. Let's get back to, to Christianity 101. Who are you? Who called you? Who died for you? Who forgave you of your sins? Let's get back on that path of track again. And in verse 8, he says, For even if I made you grieve by or with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. You know how sometimes, folks, and, and sometimes it's hard to make sense of what he's saying here, but you know how sometimes when you have to meet with someone and you know the, the situation might cause some problems, like conflict, disagreement, arguments. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of like thinking about him here. I'm sure he's thinking, man, I just don't want to do this. You know, it's hard, to, it's hard to admonish someone, to discipline someone, just like parents. You know how hard it is to discipline your children. 
And, you know, you tell little Jimmy, you say, this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. And sometimes you might be thinking, well, little Jimmy might say, well, don't do it. But, you know, the fact is, you don't enjoy doing those things. In fact, it's last on the list. And I know Paul had to feel that way. But at the same time, he's saying, because I wrote you this stinging letter, I don't regret it. Because it's going to move you. It's going to move you in this direction towards repentance. Now, you know, there's people who say, well, that's, repentance is just for the unbeliever. No, this is for Christians. I don't know how, you see, the, the, the Pharisees had it all backwards. The Jews, the religious leaders, they thought they never sinned. You know, can you imagine you got that frame of mind? I was talking to somebody the other day, and so I started going through the Ten Commandments with them, and I got to the first one, it was stealing. I said, did you steal before? And, no. You see, you see what happens? You see what, how people think today? It's like, you know, hey, listen, no, no, no. Well, okay, well, let's get to the next one. How about, did you ever lust at a woman? Oh. It gets them every time. But you see, unless what we're confronted with the truth, which, listen, I don't stand around just so we can't wait to, to get in somebody's face and, and tell them that they're wrong. You know, and he didn't want to do that either, but he understood there's going to be a desired result with no regrets. As difficult as a challenge that is. Now, like I said, some people don't have a problem getting in somebody's face. But remember, why are you doing it? What's the purpose? Why was Paul doing it? Why did he send that stinging letter? Because he loved them. And what parent does not love their children if you don't discipline them? Because if you don't discipline them, you don't love them, right? <clears throat> And as difficult as that may be at times, we have no other option because we love them. This is what Paul is saying. I love them. Love them. This is what I want them to do. So when we think about repentance, we think of what? What is the definition of it? And again, I lost all of my PowerPoint, so I'm just going to have to tell you. In the Greek, it means nemetoneo, and it means to have a change of mind, to have a change of heart that does this. It has a lasting effect. People can say they're sorry, but that doesn't mean you're going to change. This is what this word means. It's a grievance unto what? To change. Thomas Watson, the great Puritan preacher, and Henry Smith said this. Thomas Watson said this. He said, Wouldst thou know? Now, this English is pretty difficult, so I'm trying not to tie my tongue up. Wouldst thou know when thou hast been humbled enough? For sin, when thou art willing to let go by sins. Think about that. Would thou know when thou has been humbled enough for sin, when thou art willing to let go by sins? In other words, haven't you learned that sin is going to destroy you? That sin has consequences, so you need to let it go. It's like a hot potato. Henry Smith said this, The wicked do but weep for their sins past, but the godly purpose to sin no more. You see the difference? So, verse 8, as Paul is telling these believers... He says, for even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that, there, that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. You see, because you wonder, and I, and I know there's a temptation sometimes because you think, and I know parents, I know it's hard sometimes, but we, th we think, and I know I've heard the, ca the case many times, where parents are afraid to discipline their children. Why? Because they think they won't love them anymore. I don't want to discipline my children because I want them to make their own choices in life. Are you kidding me? You're raising a criminal. Disciplining a child is very important. Same way with adults. We need... Let me ask you, what's your attitude towards discipline? What's your attitude towards correction? 
admonishment. Because the scripture is clear. The corrections of life or disciplines of life are a way of life. Corre discipline is a way of life. So you know what? I may not like it, but you know what? If someone comes to me and shares with me my wrong season with grace, I don't have a problem submitting to it. But here's the thing. If I'm daily abiding in the Word of God, daily, abiding in Christ daily, the Holy Spirit of God is going to convict me of my sin. And let me just say this too. The Holy Spirit of God, by far, has a better way of convicting you and me of sin than any person. And why do, I, why do I say that? Because He, the Holy Spirit, who's for real, has my deepest interest at hand. What is that? To conform me to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. As a Christian, I should desire that more than anything else in this world, above anything else in this world, to be conformed to His Son. You say, well... Man, I don't, I don't want to suffer. Where in the Bible does it say you're not called to suffer? Where in the Bible does it say that you will never be rebuked? Where in the Bible does it say that you stop growing as a Christian? Because that's part of it. That's part of the calling in life. Every one of us are called to suffer. So not only looking at repentance is not something that you would ever regret. Because, you know, the thing, thing about repentance, the day that I repented of my sin and trusted in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I never regretted it. And I'm telling you the gospel truth here. I have no reason to lie to you. And I'm sure some of you would say the same thing. When you gave your life to Christ, you never regretted it. Now, I'm not saying there weren't any road bumps in the road. I'm not saying there weren't any potholes, which we've got plenty of them here in St. Andrew Parish. I'm not saying there weren't any potholes or difficulties or trials and troubles in life. I'm not saying that, that those things didn't exist. They did. But what has happened? God has brought me through it to this day. And He continues to give me deliverance and His people deliverance without regret. And you know, if you're truly honest... You never regretted it either as a believer. I'll never forget, I was sharing with a young lady one day. I, was on, I used to be on that ice cream route and walked to a store one day. And So I'm always looking to share with someone about Jesus Christ and how he impacted my life. Always looking for that. And one day I was sharing with this young lady. I said, uh, how has Christ impacted your life? As I gave my testimony. And she said, well, I did that one time. And it didn't work out for me. I said, really? So what happened? She said, it didn't work out. And you know, I thought about that, and I said, you know what? I don't understand. Why would it not work out? What do you mean, Christ, or what do you mean, Christianity didn't work out for you? And so it dawned on me over a period of time, there was no real repentance in that. There was none. And, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, did I really genuinely receive Christ? Because if you did, then you wouldn't have any regret. Secondly, this morning, true repentance offers deliverance. Beginning in verse number, uh, verse 9. He says, As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved. See, he's not, he's not standing up on some podium somewhere or some house. He's saying, you know, I'm so glad they, they are, they're broken over their sin. You know, grieved, in other words, sorrowful for their sin. He said, but because you were grieved into what? Into repenting, changing your mind about your attitude towards your sin, about what you were allowing in the church. Why? For or because? Because you felt, notice, a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. Well, what does godly grief, what does godly grief produce? 
verse 10, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation. Salvation, and then you can also accompany spiritual growth and maturity. Because it's ongoing in every Christian's life. You see, one day, as a believer, you're going to die. And whether you have eternal life or not depends so much entirely on your profession, your confession of who Christ is in your life, whether he's the Lord of your life or not, whether you genuinely repented of your sin or not. Because without Christ, no man shall see God. No man shall enter into heaven's glory without Jesus Christ and without truly repenting of your sin. Now notice he says, without grace, grace without regret, regret, whereas godly or worldly, I'm sorry, worldly grief produces what? Death. So, what does godly grief produce? It has a life-changing effect. I'd like for us to turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. I'd like to read this parable to you. Jesus gave many parables in the Bible. Some were very hard to understand. But then some of them, you know, if you read it just at face value, it can be, with head knowledge, it can be understandable. But Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse number 28, Jesus talks about these parable about two sons. And he says in verse 28, he says, What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son, and he said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but I didn't, but I, I go, sir, but didn't not go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? And he said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. John, for John came to you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you, didn't, you did not afterward change your minds Change your minds, repent, and believe him. See, one son, hey, no, I didn't want to do it, but you know what? I went ahead and done it anyway. And the other son, oh, I'll go do it, but didn't do it. You see the difference between the two? It falls in line with repentance. See, just because somebody prayed a prayer, walked an aisle, felt sorry, had a, you know, just broke out in tears. And I, I remember this guy one time, and, you know, I went to visit him and, you know, sat in his living room and began to share with him the gospel. And he says, oh, he says, I want to believe in Jesus. So, and that wasn't just him, it was several other people. Same thing. Oh, I believe in this Jesus. Well, well what, what do I need to do? I said, you need to repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus. Get down on their knees. Some cry. Some have an emotional reaction. You know, I'm thinking, wow, they're serious. You see, only God's looking in their heart whether they're serious or not. And I'm thinking, man, they received Christ. Next week, as I ask them, as a challenge to come to church next Sunday, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll share it with the rest of the congregation. We'll give God the praise and the honor and glory. Are we ready to do that? Oh, yeah. Not long ago, I met up with a guy and, you know, talking to him and sharing with him the gospel. And I said, well, are you willing to bow your heart to Christ? Are you willing to repent of your sin? I mean, the conversations you have with people that tell you these things. But you see, I love you enough to tell you what is true. Paul's loving them enough to tell them what is true concerning the gospel. And he said, yeah, he said, I'm willing to do it. Okay, well, you know what? Let's pray. Pray to receive Christ. Pray to receive Christ. Come one visit. Guess what? Don't see him after that. What happened? There's something wrong with the prayer? <laughs> There's something wrong with my prayer? Maybe it's, maybe it's me. I don't know. I ask, maybe it's me. But, but do you understand? Do you understand what the gospel means here? Worldly grief doesn't lead to salvation. 
Godly grief, godly sorrow leads to salvation, according to what Paul is saying here. Worldly, worldly grief says this, oh, I'm so sorry I got caught. That's all it says. All those prisoners I used to talk to here and share the gospel with them. None of them were wrong. None of them were guilty, but they were all sinners. They didn't have a problem saying they were all sinners. Oh, we received Jesus. But you see, they got caught. <laughs> and that's what happens. Worldly grief means you got caught. So you might cry. You might have an emotional reaction. Just like Billy Graham's crusades. A lot of people, when he would challenge them, fire and brimstone messages, he challenged them. They walked those aisles from those stadiums, wherever he preached the Word of God. Some crying. Some had to be led out. Some pass out. I mean, you know, it goes on and on. But he said only about 10% of them ever really, genuinely gave their heart to Christ. We're talking about millions of people. What was wrong with Billy Graham's message? Nothing. What was wrong with the Bible and its message? Nothing. You see, it's the heart. The Bible says it clearly. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? You can't even know your own heart. That's why so many people don't think that they've ever stole anything in their life or never told a lie in their life. What are they judging themselves by? They're judging themselves by one another. Who is the standard? That's why the Bible clearly says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God is the standard, friends. God is a standard. The reflection is not you. The reflection of Christ in you, as Paul is addressing here, is that true, true repentance will offer deliverance and freedom like you've never experienced before in your life. But I understand. I understand the difficulty. I understand the struggle every one of us face every day. And, uh, in fact, in Hebrews chapter 12... We see an illustration of Esau. What happened to Esau when he sold his birthright out to Jacob? In fact, in, in, East, in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 through 17, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 through 17, the writer of Hebrews says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that not a root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. And look what it cost him. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. He went to his dad and said, please, 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 I didn't know what I was doing. And he's crying. He said, I want my birthright. Remember, the first son was get, got to all the birthright. They were in charge of everything after mom and dad had passed away. And he sold out to his brother Jacob for a bowl of red soup. <laughs> Boy, there's so much we can learn right here. Because you know, people today are selling their soul for pottage. So many people today think that's all there is is what's in this life. Don't be deceived. There is going to be another life. But for the Christian, it begins right now. And the fact that, see, this life that God offers to you now, just like he had offered it to Esau, Esau said, you know what? <laughs> I got what I want better, and that is this world. And so he sold his birthright off just for one bowl of red soup, and now he wants it back. What does the Bible, what does the Bible say? What does it say? For he found no chance to repent. Where does that repentance come from? God. It's a gift. He had no chance to come back. Now, we're going to look at a couple individuals here. 
Because when I talk about repentance offering deliverance, listen, folks, Christians, we don't know how blessed we truly are. I don't know about you, but I, you know what? I don't give God thanks enough for His deliverance. Oh, that's a whole different topical message altogether. But we're going to look at a couple of folks. But remember, we're talking about sorrow. We're talking about godly sorrow, divine sorrow, and we're talking about worldly sorrow, human sorrow, worldly sorrow. There are two, there are two responses to that sorrow. We're going to look at two kings. So if you would, turn to 2 Samuel. I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 15. Oh, in the Old Testament, you just keep going to the left there. 1 Samuel chapter 15, we're going to look at, first the guy we're going to look at is King Saul, and we're going to see his response. Remember, he was the first king in Israel, chapter 15, verse 7. And we're going to see what happened to this guy as a result of him and his dealings. Of course, remember, we had a study on Saul somewhat, and uh, we determined what kind of individual he was. But nevertheless, he's a king. He's the king of Israel, first king of Israel. But chapters, in chapter 15, verse 7, if you would follow along with me as I read it to you. I'll try to be very brief here, but look at verse 7. And he took Agag, the king of Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Now, God spoke to them through the prophet Samuel and told him, and the people of Israel, don't spare anything. Don't take anything for yourself. Kill all the people, all the Amalekites. Kill all their livestock. Destroy everything. Devoted to destruction. Everything. But he decided he wanted to keep a few trinkets. He was going to do things his way. Okay, well, that's not too bad yet. But it's how, it's how he responded to correction, to rebuke. Ha, watch this. First thing he did as a result of this worldly sorrow, look at verse 21. Same chapter. But the people took the spoil and the sheep, the best things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. First point, he blamed the people for his decision. Got caught. He's expressing some worldly sorrow here, but he's blaming the people to justify his actions. Secondly, the next thing he tries to do is justify his sin. Verse 22, and Samuel said, Has the Lord as gra has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, than to listen, than to far the fat of rams. What did he say? What, is, what did Saul say? Oh, I'm saving some of those, those heifers. I'm saving some of those bulls to sacrifice on God's altar. That's how he justified his sin. We were listening in Sunday school this morning, talking about this businessman. He was talking about how this businessman dealt with his people, in other words, his customers, and he treated them all fairly. But when it came to those who sold him the goods, he was very harsh with them. In fact, he did many, many dishonest things with the people he dealt business with. That sold him the goods. And he just justified that. This is what he's doing. He's blaming the people, and now he's justifying his sin by saying, oh, I'm just going to save a few of those cattle for the sacrifice on the altar for God. Justifying his sin. So what else he does? Again, now, it's this worldly sorrow. He professed a sorrow for getting caught. 
Verse 23, For rebellion is the sin of divination, and presumption is an iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you for being king. Uh-oh. He's going to lose his kingship. Saul said to Samuel, Now, again, worldly sorrow. I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your of, of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Ha! Seriously? He cared more about what they thought about him. He cared about what man thought about him versus what God thought about him. That's worldly sorrow. You see, you might shed some tears. You might show some grief. You might show some sorrow. But ultimately, you can hear it. It's just a blame game. It's not my fault. Now today, we have a society that says, well, you know, sin's not people's problem. We don't talk about sin. We just talk about what? Oh, it's this, you know, this tragedy in my life. It's this... Whatever it is, it's because, you know, stealing now is a disease. Lying is a disease. We don't want to call it what it really is. It's sin. We don't want to take full responsibility because it's what? It's sin. It's something God called sin. So that's what worldly sorrow produces. Now, what did David do? King David. Let's see his response. He got caught doing something, too. In fact, he, remember what he did? He murdered one of his best friends. He stole his woman, committed adultery. The list goes on. For a whole year, he lived that way in sin. But let's see, let's see how he dealt with it. So in, uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, Second Samuel chapter 12. Uh-oh, the prophet's coming. He's going to point his finger at him. He's unsuspected about what's about ready to happen. And let me tell you, just like Samuel, he didn't take great delight in having to confront King Saul about his sin. In fact, he cried, he cried out to the Lord. He, says, he, said, he said, Lord, I'm in fear of my life because he might kill me, and he just might do that. But God said, I'll take care of that. Now here's Nathan, on the other hand, going to rebuke David. And let's see, just look at the reaction of this guy. He judged, and he judged himself by what? By God and by the Word. So as David's standing in the place of the Lord, speaking to David about his sin, here's how the story unfolds. Verse 1, And the Lord said to Nathan, sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb. And when he had bought, which he had bought, and when he bought it up, and he grew it up with him and his children, with his children, it used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup, and he lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now, there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the, the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. Well, there's a, this man becomes very indignant, right? Self-righteous here, right? Verse 6, And he shall restore his lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and became, and because he had no pity. You know, sometimes your words will either bless you or condemn you. Verse 7, Nathan said to David, You are the man. In other words, you're that rich man. 
Thus says the Lord. You always, years go back when you hear the prophet speak this way. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives unto, unto your, your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if there are little too, and if there were too little, I would add you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite and the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised and you have taken the wife of the Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up an evil against you of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbors and they shall be with your wives in the sight of, the, of his son for you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Now watch this. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And David, and Nathan said to David, The Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. He didn't justify his sin. Godly grief leaves no room for you to justify your sin. What does it do? Causes you to repent. And that's exactly what David did. In fact, he wrote Psalm, in Psalm you don't have to turn there, but in Psalm 32, here you can see the visible heart of a man when a man has gotten right before God. When someone who truly possesses the gift, the divine gift of repentance from the Lord. Here's what he says in verse 3 and 4. He says, For when, when I kept silent, talking about his sin, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. You see, here was a man who was living in sin for a year, and he knew the law. He was the king of Israel. And he tried to keep it from the people of Israel, but they knew. <laughs> He, and, and you know what he tried to do? He tried to keep it from God. But God knew. But all the while, he says, my bones wasted away through my groanings all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of summer. He's looking for comfort, but he can find no rest. Why? Because he was God's anointed. You see, people, God's people, church, God's people will not continue to live in sin. Amen, Brother Tony. Oh, you may sin, but you're not going to stay in it. Why? Because you have a different nature. When you came to Christ, you didn't just, half of you came to Christ. Right? You surrendered totally to Christ. That meant what? He now owns you, Christian. You can't do like Saul and pick and choose what you want out of the Bible. That's what he did. He chose and he picked what he wanted to obey. And that's exactly what's happening in the church circles today. We pick and choose what we want to do. Preached a message a couple of weeks ago about getting on the same page with God. Fact is, not everybody's on God's page. We want God on our page, but we don't want to get on His page. See, so there's a difference between worldly grief or sorrow and divine sorrow. Another passage or group of passages of scriptures, Psalm 51, beautiful. Here again, we see the heart of a man. David. <laughs> You, you, you just, you know what I get from that? I just get a man who's so grateful because of what the grace of God on his life. And, and, and he says in this particular passage from chapter, chapter 51, verses 1 through 19, just listen. I won't read the whole thing. Just read a few of, a few of the verses. Just kind of get a sense where he's 
in his relationship with the Lord. He says, have mercy on me, O God, verse 1, according to your steadfast love. When you see steadfast love, that's grace. <laughs> because none of us deserve that. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from what? My sin. He didn't say, notice he didn't say sins. He said sin. Why? Because he lived in a body of sin. You live in a body of sin. That means you still sometimes sin as a Christian. You see? Some of us feel like we don't need to repent. But Christian, you need to repent if you sinned. Now, why? Verse 3 says, for I, know my for I know my transgressions and my sin are ever before me. You can't help but, you see, you stay in the Word of God, God's going to reveal that sin in your life. Notice where he lays all the charges. He didn't blame everybody. He didn't blame his spouse. He didn't blame, you know, Beersheba. Notice verse 4, he says, against you, only you only have I sinned and done what was evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Verse 6, Behold, you delight in truth and in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, that I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. He was a man who was just so desperate for God's cleansing in his life. Folks, you can't forgive yourself. You can't. You might try to forget it. You might take drugs and try to not remember it anymore. But you can't forgive yourself. Here's a man who's crying out to the Lord to search his heart, to look inside of him, that his desperate plea was this, to be restored in his relationship with the Lord. Why? Because sin severed that relationship. See, that's what, what divine, godly grief will do in a Christian's heart. Verse 8 and 9, he says... Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. See, we can't forgive ourselves and nor can we admit our sins. Only God can do that. And guess how he's appropriated that? Through the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So we see the heart of a man. So not only does repentance not lead to regret... And not only does repentance also bring deliverance in our lives, but also this third thing here this morning. True repentance offers desired effects. Always. Let me tell you, if you do things God's ways, His way and only His way, there will be the desired effect of that. So back over in 2 Corinthians, we're almost finished. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Joyous, or should I say, godly grief offers a joyous conclusion. Now, Paul is rejoicing here. He's giving thanks to the Lord because by now these Christians are willing to deal with their sin both inwardly and outwardly by what they allowed in the church and by what they were going to do with the situation already occurring in their church, and they did. They put out the individual who is committing the sin. But even more than that, what Paul is not, fo what, what he's not focusing on is the sin in particular. What he's focusing on is what they were willing to do. They were willing to deal with it as a church body. You see? And now he's, He's concluding here in this chapter about this godly grief, how, it, how it's going to end up in a joyous conclusion here. Notice what he says, beginning in verse number, um, let's see where I left off. Verse 11, for he says, for we see that earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. See, this, in other words, they had, this, they had this desire to do something that was according to the will of God. But also, notice, their eagerness to clear yourselves 
What indignation. In other words, they were just so angry now at the sin. Not the person, the behavior. You, you follow what I'm saying? You know, these abortionists, people who march the streets and, and, and they're, they're, on the, they're, they're wanting to, to, you know, they're pro-death and everything else. People are homosexuals or drug addicts or whatever or, or illegal aliens or all this other stuff you see on the news today. The people focus at the people rather than what? The behavior. The sin itself. When you know sin does what? Brings death. Because that's what he said about worldly grief. Ultimately, it brings death. Not life, not freedom. But he says, I'm recognizing the fact that you were willing to deal with it. And it brings joy to your heart. Now that you see what? You're doing the right thing. It's a hard thing, but it's the right thing. What indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. You see, it calls sometimes for inconvenience. But at, at every turn, it's the right thing to do. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. See, because they were willing to deal with it. After Paul rebuked them in that severe letter, not knowing whether or not they were going to have any communication, but Paul, Titus, Titus sent Paul, he sent Titus over there to, to, to see what was going on, to see how they were responding. And they've responded favorably to the severe le letter. And I'm sure some of them didn't like it, but you know what? It was the right thing to do. Verse 12, so although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who had did wrong. Notice, he didn't focus on the, on the, on the person. He wasn't focusing on that person. And, and sometimes that happens, you see. Nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong. No, that wasn't his focus. Notice. But in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. See, who's got the bigger picture here? God does. What is God wanting to do? Restore. You know, every time God brings judgment, guess what? There's always restoration to follow. But you see, there will be those who don't want to. You see, most of Israel tonight is secular, today is a secular country. They don't know Jesus is the Messiah. One day they will all come to Christ. They will all come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I've got to tell you, we're getting closer and closer to that day of coming. I, <laughs> you keep it up with the Middle East, right? Yeah. And, and, and the way that some of these folks have a button now they can push, it may not be as big as our button, but they push a button that can annihilate thousands and millions of people with one button. I mean, it's even, the heightened sense of it is even more so today than it was 30 years ago. So Paul is telling these Christians, listen, I'm commending you for the fact that you responded favorably, although you may not have liked it, but you did the right thing, and now, see, as a result of this, you're going to be joyous. You're going to be happy. You're going to be pleased. You're going to be grateful that you did the right thing even though it might have been unpleasant for you. He says, notice, verse 13, Therefore you, we, are, we are comforted, and besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus. Why? Because his spirit had been refreshed by you all. See, again, he saw it, he witnessed it, how they were willing to change. You see, that's the whole point, isn't it? Are we willing to change? Verse 14, for whatever boast I made about him, about you, him about you, I was not put to shame. You see, doing the right thing won't put you to shame, amen? But just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. And the effect, his affection for you is even greater, as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's another topical subject, by the way. I think R.C. Sproul wrote a book on fear and trembling. He says, I rejoice because I have perfect confidence in you. Wasn't that great, huh? As a conclusion here, at the, at the end, there's comfort, there's encouragement among brothers and sisters in Christ for doing the right thing, and there's love, and there's honor and, and support for each other before, during, and after the effects of sin. Folks, God never stops loving you and me. Isn't that great? So no matter where you find yourself, 
Maybe you're not totally submitted to the Lord. Maybe you haven't completely submitted to the Lord, surrendered your heart to Christ. Maybe there's some sin in your life right now that you're dealing with and you just don't, you know, maybe you just put it aside and you thought, well, there's no big deal and whatever. God still loves you. That's why you should never look at God and say, okay, that's, there's this what, servile fear and there's this filial fear. It shouldn't be the servile fear, fear where God's going to just drop a brick on my head. But just remember this, there's always consequences for sin. Just remember that. It's the choices we make. The filial fear says this, I'm, some, I'm reverently humbling myself before the Lord. I want to get right before the Lord. Why? Because He's my Lord. He's my Daddy. He wants me to come to Him on His terms. Repentance, anyone? You find yourself today in need of repentance? Well, you got to go to the one who gives the gift of repentance. Godly sorrow or worldly sorrow? What is the choice? Would you stand, please?